A nurse in Jamaica, Queens, New York, felt unsafe in her home. Crime was on the rise, and the police had been slow to respond to emergency calls, specifically in African-American neighborhoods. The nurse worked long hours, and her schedule often conflicted with that of her husband's. So she wanted a way to feel safe in her home, a way to feel comfortable when she was alone. Specifically, she wanted to be able to see and hear who was at her front door from any room in the house. In 1966, this nurse would design a closed circuit security system that transferred camera images onto a television monitor. The system was wireless and radio controlled and would transfer these images onto a monitor or a set of monitors anywhere in the home. Not only could a person see who was at the door, they could also talk to that person via a set of two-way microphones. That nurse, was Marie Van Britten Brown, a 43-year-old African-American woman. Brown's patent and invention is literally credited with bringing closed-circuit television to the forefront of our everyday lives. Her work laid the foundation for the elaborate camera and alarm monitoring systems we have today. Now, I'm not saying without Brown we wouldn't have our high-tech alarm systems. But I am saying prior to Brown, no one had the necessity, which according to my grandmother is the mother of invention, or the wherewithal to put the pieces together the way that she did. Brown's unique experience, coupled with her desire for safety, led her to create the solution that she needed to make her life better. Necessity, invention. So what would our lives be like without Brown's invention? What would crime look like? What would solving crime look like? This is a world without black women, scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. This is a world without home heaters, cataract devices, hairbrushes, call waiting, even caller ID. You see, these and many other inventions were created by black women who saw a need or a problem and not only designed a solution, but a solution that's centered on the fundamental theories, strategies, principles, and techniques that we utilize in science, technology, engineering, and math, affectionately known as STEM. These women were not just motivated to create, but literally needed these inventions to make their lives easier. Necessity, invention. Women like Sarah Boone, an African-American dressmaker in the 1800s who wanted a better way to iron the garments that she designed. Her solution? She created and patented the first ironing board with collapsible legs. Necessity, invention. Women like Mary Beatrice Kenner, who designed a belt to hold a menstrual towel in the 1900s, a time when menstrual protection was described as being too large, too stiff, and too uncomfortable. It wasn't conducive for wearing outside of the home, but Mary, who had to leave her house to work, sought to change that. Necessity, invention. Principles, strategies, techniques, and theories that I would utilize as I pursue my bachelor's in chemistry, my PhD in biomedical research, and my MBA. You see, despite these and many other solutions to society's problems created by black women, via skill sets developed through STEM, the number of black women in STEM remains extremely low. Black women make up only 2.9% of STEM undergraduate degrees, 3.5% of doctoral degrees, and only 1.8% of the STEM workforce. To put this into context, imagine how many more modern conveniences, innovative solutions, and overall problems we could solve as a country if these numbers were higher. Data shows us that diverse teams, and I don't just mean diversity in thought, lead to innovative and productive solutions. 
The ability to incorporate lived experiences, different perspectives, and overall methods of solving problems allows teams to tackle complex issues with a more comprehensive approach. You see, diverse teams are more creative, they're more profitable, and they're just better overall at problem solving. So as black women, we not only bring our technical expertise to this space, but we also bring our lived experience, laying the foundation and the groundwork for phenomenal solutions. A few years ago, a hair care company realized that their products catered solely to white hair care, white hair care textures. In an effort to change this, the company reevaluated and utilizing a more diverse team, they discovered that they were missing out on the $1.8 billion hair care company that caters to black women. Diversity leads to profit. Solution? The company set up testing salons and invited 50 African American men and women weekly into these salons to try out their products and share their user experiences. The result? Upgraded formulas with 88% more moisture, detangling conditioners, and even hair recovery masks, all infused with things like honey and coconut oil. The company even developed a skincare line targeting African Americans. Diversity leads to creativity. In his book, The Diversity Bonus, University of Michigan professor and social scientist Scott Page looked at groups that represent cognitive diversity differences in how we think, interpret, or solve problems. He found that the ability to think differently was directly affected by our identification with certain groups, like gender, race, socioeconomic status. And this connection created something extra, a bonus, lanyard, as we say where I'm from. Page goes on to lay out a mathematical rationale and logic for diversity. He shows that when trying to solve complex problems, like in STEM, results arise from diverse perspectives. The ability to look at a problem differently is much more important than one's own ability. So when groups of individuals are working together to solve complex problems, the diversity of the problem solvers matters more than their individual ability. In a 2010 research study, conducted by researchers from Carnegie Mellon University, MIT, and Union College. They observed 700 individuals working in groups of two to five for five hours. The groups performed various tasks ranging from puzzles and brainstorming to more complicated tasks such as architectural design. The researchers discovered that the primary predictor of performance, and I mean true performance, was not the average intelligence of the group members, but the collective measure of intelligence of the group. One indicator of collective intelligence, the presence of women. Groups with women are more open to new ideas, more flexible, and more creative. And I know this to be more than just data as I've lived many of these experiences. In a prior role, I served as the second African-American woman director and the youngest. These two identities that make up who I am but don't completely define me allow me to view old problems with new eyes. Under my leadership and tenure, I was able to take my team and my company into uncharted territories, increasing the number of non-white males working, learning, and thriving in my company's STEM portfolio. Having faced many of the challenges and barriers associated with taking my place in STEM, I was able to use that lens to account for my company's relatability problems. You see, my very existence in that role, my ability to succeed in that role, hard on my ability to make that space more diverse. Necessity, invention. In 2016, my mother died of pancreatic cancer. If you remember nothing else I say today, remember these three things about pancreatic cancer. The symptoms are subtle. Most people don't know them and tend to ignore them. The time from diagnosis to death is about three months. And it's usually diagnosed at stage four, making survival very difficult. My mother had always gone to the doctor. She was a middle class, college educated African American woman living in the southern United States, specifically New Orleans. 
Her life, her norms, her habits, all reflected a culture of red beans on Monday, fried fish on Friday, and a whole lot of cuisine based with butter and cream sauces. My mother was overweight, according to the BMI scale, and she did little to no exercise, unless you count walking around the mall, which we do. So in November of 2015, when she complained of trouble eating, vomiting, stomach aches, and diarrhea, her doctors diagnosed her with stomach ulcers, gave her medication, and told her to follow up if the symptoms persisted. She would go on to follow up three more times until finally in January of 2016, she'd be diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And we would learn that the previously diagnosed ulcers were actually tumors moving through her stomach wall. My mother's entire medical team did not look like her. They were not from her part of the country. They didn't share any of her lived experiences. And so they didn't dive deeper or look past initial symptoms and data. Data shows us that overweight black women tend to have high cases of diabetes. So the overweight black woman in front of them must also have diabetes. Data shows us that New Orleans cuisine is spicy and high in salt. So the New Orleanian in front of them must have stomach ulcers due to a poor diet. My mother would go on to live three months from her initial diagnosis and proceed to approach death with the most style and grace I have ever seen. But I can't help but wonder what her experience would have been like if her team had been more diverse. If someone on her medical team had shared her lived experiences, we also know that there are disparities in cancer treatment, prevention, and, and care. We know that only 5% of oncologists are black and less than 2% are black women. So I can't help but wonder if these numbers were different, would her experience have been different? If these numbers were different and one of her team, her medical care team members had been a black woman, would she have known that the BMI scale, which was designed with white men and women in mind, was not a good indicator of her health? If one of her team members had been from New Orleans, would they have known about the 80 mile stretch land, the 80 mile region of land in New Orleans, Louisiana, known as Cancer Alley? I wonder. So what do we do? How do we fix this? We know that the number of black women in STEM is critically low. We know that to address this is gonna take everything we have all at once. We know that a few DEI policies and admission practices, though very important, are not gonna fix this systemic issue. But there are a few things that we as a society, as a culture, can do. Schools and colleges, they can create more programs to foster black women entering into STEM professions, mentorship opportunities, internships, and scholarships. As a black woman in STEM, I know the biases, the challenges, and barriers to pursue my education. I know that I had to be twice as good to garner one-fourth of the recognition. So creating opportunities for more women that look like me is something that schools and colleges can do. Companies. Companies can, cre can create clear diversity goals. They can create affinity groups that help women and other identities that have been excluded from STEM to feel safe and like they belong. Being one of the only or the only is an isolating and lonely feeling. We need to create counter spaces or safe spaces for those identities that are not historically represented in STEM to feel comfortable and relaxed. Having to consistently explain your identity is taxing on the body. Government. The government can create policies that promote STEM research, that encourage individuals to want to pursue diversity goals. We know that the number of black women in STEM is extremely low because someone somewhere did research on the subject. Someone somewhere decided that the numbers were so low, there was a problem, that they needed to design research to investigate. They need to tell this story. That research, that story, that data was likely funded by government and private grants and media. The media has to do a better job of telling the stories of black women in STEM, normalizing our presence in this very field. Stories like Mary Beatrice Brown, Sarah Boone, and Mrs. Kenner should not be stories that we take off the shelf once a year, but stories that are told consistently and frequently. So, if my grandmother was right, which she often was, we are in a critical need for more diversity in STEM, more innovative solutions and modern conveniences. 
We need more diverse voices. We need black women in STEM. Thank you.